Okay. So uh, the title of the um, the talk is uh, "What Users Want," um, or "Why Web Pages Are Dead." I'll get to that much later, but um, that's. Uh, uh, let me introduce you a little bit uh, to Forum One. Uh, we've been around uh, about 15 years, just over 15 years, and uh, we work uh, primarily with nonprofits, uh, NGOs, uh, and public-facing organizations, and uh, and government uh, agencies as well, and. Uh, we specialize in uh, web strategy, user experience, uh, design, and also development. Uh, and uh, most of our development is actually in Drupal. We've been using Drupal for quite a few years. And here are some of the uh, clients that we work with. All right, so um, human beings, human beings. Um, we've been mobile ever since we've started to walk, right? And uh, we've walked around, and we've um, we've been hunting, we've been gathering berries, and we've been cultivating our land. And at some point in our human history, we got tethered to our desks. And as you can see at the end there, you know, a couple of years ago, it was it was completely natural. And you know, a lot of us are, are this way these days as well. But um, we we sit in front of our computers for eight to ten hours a day and we're just completely stationary. And you take a look at what we do you know, all day long, and this is what we do. But fortunately, in the past couple of years, smartphones have, uh, have, have appeared, and we've finally been re-liberated. We reconnected with our true selves, which are actually mobile. We like moving around, we like doing things on the move, and that is our natural selves. Being tethered to a desk, looking at a small monitor all day long is not the optimal experience. And actually, um, equipment sales kind of uh, support that also. So if you take a look at, um, you see the flatlining line, that's PC sales around the world. And if you take a look at the one that's hockey st sticking, it's actually the, the sales of, of mobile devices, which include smartphones and, uh, and tablet devices. So as you can see, sales of PCs have flatlined, whereas uh, sales of mobile devices are actually increasing. What this means for everybody and what this means for us um, as, as, uh, as people in technology, as people in user experience, uh, and, and people managing um, technology projects is that mobile is going to be the predominant way that people will access the web and access information in the future. Let me introduce you to a couple of stories, uh, personal stories actually, around uh, what users really want. So, um, so what do I want? What do I want to do with technology? Here's a couple of stories around that. So um, in 2007, um, I, I went, to, went back to Korea with my family, and I'd been in the States for about 13 years before that. When I left Korea, um, I mean, Korea has a great you know, public transportation system. It had four subway lines in Seoul, and there were numerous buses, but you know there was a lot of traffic congestion, and you know you know most of the public transportation you had to buy tickets, and you know, uh, and then you had to uh, insert tokens and uh, on the buses, and you know it was okay. It was it was it was like any other major city, but when I returned in in 2007, uh, 13 years after I'd left, a huge transformation had happened. Um, first of all, there were nine subway lines in, in Seoul, and the buses had started to uh, have trunk lines and have branch lines where the, the buses, the public transportation buses, were actually going through the center of uh, major um, roads so that you can actually get somewhere much faster on buses than you could actually getting a taxi or you know getting in your car. Another big transformation that happened was they started embedding RFID chips into credit cards and, uh, and uh, traffic cards, uh, travel cards, so that each time you get onto a bus, all you have to do is tap the card on a reader, and as you get out, you tap it again. Next trip, you tap, tap. You get on the subway, you tap when you get on, and tap when you get off. And that calculates into a single fare. No matter where you go in Seoul, each time when you terminate your, 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 your uh, um, your trip, 
basically it's one single fair. Somehow, I mean, Korea's not, you know, the Korean government is not known for collaboration and collaborating around technology. They have like 12 different, you know, standards for everything, right? But the fact that somebody had the vision and the willpower to unify these systems into a single system was just mind blowing. What do the users want? The users want convenience. The users want to get from A to B in the least amount of fuss, right? And what's better than not, get be, not having to carry change, not having to carry different tokens, not having to buy a ticket at the, at the ticket counter? I mean, all you have to do is carry this one piece of plastic and you're set, right? Which is just amazing. The ama another amazing fact is there's Seoul, but there's also Incheon, which is, uh, which is pretty close to Seoul, and that's where the major airport is located. And every, all, all the, the prov province that surrounds Seoul is Gyeonggi province. And the fact that these three regional areas also decided to unify around one system is just amazing. So me as a user, I can get from a hotel in Seoul to, uh, and take many modes of transportation and get all the way to the airport on a single fare using a single piece of plastic. So the users want convenience and they were delivering that, which was really amazing. Another story is, um, is uh, you know, quite recently, so this is a, this is a map of Seattle. Uh, Forum One is located both in Washington, D.C., but also in Seattle. We have a small office in Seattle, and uh, this is where Stan and I are located. And I had a, uh, had a trip. At the, the dot at the bottom is where our offices are located in Belltown, uh, uh, in downtown Seattle. And then the, the dot kind of above that is where the University of Washington is located, which is about 15 minutes away by car. And so I had a meeting up there, and, uh, and so I did the smart thing. I pulled out my smartphone, looked at Google Maps, and, uh, and put in, put in the uh, location of where I needed to go, and it gave me information about when the next bus was going to come. So I go over to the bus station, I get on the bus, and it starts to go. Except what Google didn't tell me was the fact that this bus goes express at certain points of the day. And so instead of going to the University of Washington, I ended up 25 miles away in South Everett, which is the dot at the top, right? So major fail. And I was due for a, a client meeting at that time as well. So I'm panicking. I'm like, ah, oh, what am I going to do? And it's like, there's nothing I can do. I'm on a bus which isn't going to change course just because of me. So I had to just suck it in. I called my client and said, and told them, told them what happened, and they started laughing their heads off, <laughs> which is a good sign, I guess, right? But um, so, so they were cool with you know starting the meeting without me, um, you know, and, and waiting for my presentation. So, but I just remembered that I had used Uber uh, previously. Have you guys heard of Uber? Who who has used Uber? Okay, quite a few of you. Uh, for those who don't know, Uber is um, is a service is a is a black cab service, uh, limousine service, that has a really, really slick uh, iOS and Android application. And I just remember that I had this. I pulled it out, and this is what the interface looks like. It gives you a map of where you are, and it shows you these little small car icons that show you exactly where the nearest Uber uh, you know, car is, limousine is. And I saw that there was one 10 minutes away from the South Everett uh, transit station. So I, all you have to do is just say, pick me up here, and then about a minute later, the, the, the driver calls me to ask for exact exact location of where I am. Ten minutes later, the, the, the dude appears. I get on the get in the cab, and since the cab is really quiet, I could actually I could actually join the conference by phone and just start, you know, right when the meeting was starting, and then. When it arrived at the University of Washington, all I needed to do was get out. That's it. I didn't need to pay because my credit card information was already in there. And I didn't need to think about tip. I didn't need to do anything, right? All I needed to do later on was rate my experience. And the, the funny thing about Uber is that the driver can also rate his experience with me, right? Which is really, really great. So, through this little app, 
I was able to save my meeting and save face and, you know, really actually have a great experience and give you and, and have a story to tell you. This isn't an Uber ad in any way, but I mean, this is a great story. My need as a user was to get out of this situation as quickly as I can and get from A to B with the least amount of fuss. Much in the same way that, you know, how I wanted to be in, in Seoul with, with the public transportation system. The fact is that this is really hard. You know, you guys know how hard it is because there are so many things going on on the back end to, it, to allow for this to be so simple on the front end. There's credit card transactions, there's location-based services, there's, you know, actually, you know, locating all the cabs around you and plotting it in real time. There's a lot of, you know, technical things that are happening, but the users don't really care about that at all. What they really want to do is they want the system to understand them and to be able to accomplish what they're trying to accomplish in the least amount of uh, fuss possible. So uh, let me just talk briefly about devices and context. As you, as you know, you know, there's just a flood of new devices and you know, every, every week you, know, you have a new device coming online. Um, you, Android has over 4,000 different iterations. You know, iOS has, has a handful, but still, I mean, as designers, as technical people, you know, you have to really account for all these different devices and contexts all the time, and it's just mind-blowing how much, you know, how much thought you have to put into it. Also, there's many contexts that are also appearing as well. So let me quickly talk about that. I mean, but if you, if you break down the experience, the user experience right now as we interact with the web and as we interact with information on the web, you can break it down into a couple of major groups of experiences. Obviously, you have the PC experience, right? Where you have a keyboard, where you have a mouse. And this isn't going away because, you know, the precision of a mouse is far greater than anything that you'll have in touch. So anybody who works with graphics, anybody who works with a lot of Excel documents, you know, any, anybody who works in, in art or design, they need this kind of precision. And a keyboard, there's no device better than a keyboard for entering large bodies of text. You know, you've tried, you know, entering text uh, on an iPad. It's not optimal. If you're, if you're going to write a report, if you're going to write a long document, of course you need that keyboard. So this is one environment that we're very familiar with. Here's another one. So, you know, with the iPad, with, you know, Microsoft Surface and, and a whole host of uh, uh, Android tablets coming online, we have another, uh, a device kind of grouping, which is a, a tablet PC or a tablet. And, you know, th the way that we interact with this is that it's, um, I mean, we're, we're a lot more relaxed a lot of the times. Of course, you know, a lot of people now bring it uh, as their primary de device for work, but a lot of the times, a lot of the adults uh, in the US especially use this at home, um, complementing, you know, TV watching or, you know, browsing Facebook watching a movie on it, so it's, it's, it's in a more relaxed atmosphere. And of course you have the smartphone, which is something that is ubiquitous. It's something that we're intimately attached to. You carry it everywhere, and it's there always in your pocket that you can snap out to talk to somebody, to find out information, or to resolve a conflict around which celebrity was in which movie, right? Which is a huge use case, of course. Uh, <laughs> but basically, this is always there with you and you're in and out, you're constantly looking at it, and you know, I bet a lot of you, your batteries are drained by now, right? No? <laughs> I, think, I think especially, you know, with all, if you have a, if you have a, you know, a, a smartphone which is a couple of years old, your, your battery is dead by now, so I, I always carry an extra battery. But another context, another device grouping that is uh, actually appearing now, I think, is, is dedicated devices, I mean, health, devices. You have Nest, which is a, a thermostat that is smart and connected to the web. So you have these small devices that do small functions very d in a dedicated way. And this is a Fitbit. And uh, I know that many of you might have Fitbits. It's a little device that basically tracks your daily activity. But it connects to your smartphone, it connects to the web, and you can set up goals uh, around how much calories you want to burn each day, and it gives you a little feedback about how many steps you've taken, how many stairs you've climbed, how many calories you've burned, and it gets you kind of some feedback around whether you're meeting your daily fitness goals. 
In terms of context, so those are the devices, the big groupings of devices that we're familiar with. In terms of context, I think, you know, I, I studied architecture, and I'm always thinking about if, if I'm designing something in a virtual, uh, if I'm designing in, in a virtual experience, I'm always looking for what is the correlation, what is, what is the metaphor that I can use in the real world that will help me understand uh, this user experience. And if you take a look at the smartphone experience, if you take a look at the mobile experience, it's a lot like going to a convenience store, right? Your interactions, if you take a look at them, if you track them, are in and out, very short interactions. A quick phone call, a quick text, a quick look up. You know, right now you're probably, probably looking at, you know, what's, what's next on the schedule? So you're in and out with the information, much in the same way as you visit a convenience store. You know, people don't usually spend like half an hour or an hour in a convenience store unless you're really undecisive, right? But, uh, you know, it's because you've run out, I mean, you're, you're on a road trip and you've run out of diapers, which could be catastrophic, right? And, and you, you know exactly what you need to get. And usually, you know, if, you're, if, if, if you've been to enough 7-Elevens, you know exactly where they are, right? And you, you find what, what you need. Um, coffee is always there. So you're usually in and out very, very quickly. And that's usually, that's usually how I think about mobile experiences. If you take a look at another context, which is the social context, you have social network sites, you have social media, and you find that a lot of the times you're interacting with people in a social context, which is slightly different from a mobile context. Of course, you can have some overlap where you have, where you're browsing, you know, social media sites and social network sites like Facebook on your uh, mobile device. But, you know, let's say that there's another context, which is, you know, um, uh, social um, social interaction. So, in the real world, you know, if you take a look at social interaction, it's a lot different. I mean. Interface-wise, Facebook no looks nothing like a party. But it's actually, I mean, if you take a look at the way that people interact with each other, it's much like, you know, a party or, you know, a gathering of friends because you're basically there because you're interested in the people you're interacting with or you're interested in the topic that is being discussed, right? And that, that really makes the social interaction a lot different from a mobile interaction. In a mobile interaction, a lot of the times you just want to get in and out with an information some information, whereas the social interaction, you actually do want to hang out. You do want to spend some time with your friends. You do want to post those pictures so that you can get responses, right? And, you know, I, just last week, somebody was saying that e-commerce on, you know, and especially ads around selling you stuff and pushing products on Facebook don't really work that well simply because people are there to just hang out and enjoy each other, and they're not in a information a browsing shopping uh, mindset. They just want to talk and they just, just want to browse images and they just want to interact. And that mode of interaction, this relaxed mode of interacting with friends is a lot different from actually information gathering or, um, or commercial activity. So there's another context. Um, and, you know, the final context is, is what the web is traditionally known for, which is information delivery. And I see that um, in, in the real world, a uh, correlation to that is uh, a library. This is the Seattle Public Library, or maybe a department store, where you have all these many things. And that's what you know, information architects have traditionally done. We've, we understand the content that's in, in the site, and we break it out, and so that the users coming through that front door knows where, where they need to go to find a book, to find a piece of uh, clothing, to find a furniture that they're looking for or find the information on your website that they're, they're looking for. So a lot of the times, if you take a look at the way that Seattle Public Library has configured itself in terms of um, actually organizing physical information, that is, that is m and, and the way that the process in which you go through in order to organize that information is a lot similar to the way that a lot of information-heavy websites are, are organized. So to recap, there's you know, may, maybe four major device contexts, the PC, uh, the desktop PC, the tablet, uh, the smartphone, and dedicated devices, small devices. And there's, you know, uh, three major contexts in which we need to uh, interact, which is um, a mobile context where your short bursts of information, the social context, and then the informational context. So, this is the context and these are the devices that we work with. Uh, the issue for user experience is that 
users don't stay on one context or one device. They jump around depending on what they are doing and what their needs are and what their goals are. So let's just take one example once again, the Fitbit. So, you know, when you're running, you're not gonna carry a PC with you, right? You're not gonna carry a tablet device with you. Maybe, you know, you can, maybe somebody can develop a big strap that you can carry a, a tablet PC, kind of like a Teletubby, you know, running around. But you, you, you would never carry a tablet with you. Uh, however, you know, Fitbit, understanding this, has developed a wristband which collects your information. And what's really cool about this wristband is it, 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 it really reduced the amount of information it wants to give you in order to motivate you. All it has is five LEDs. It has five LEDs which tell you how far, or the progress that you've made towards your fitness goal for that one day. So if you have three, you realize, oh, I need to get, get more exercise. So you might go out for lunch and walk around the neighborhood. If you're at you know, four when you're going home, you might get off you know, two stops before your stop uh, on, on the bus and actually walk home so that you can fulfill your, your, you know, um, your fitness goals for that day. So here again, minimal amount of information on this dedicated device uh, for that's, that's exactly what the user needs at, in that context when they're moving about. They don't want you know, huge infographics in front of them. They just want a little piece of information, a little reminder that tells them how far they've gone. However, if you take a look at, I mean, it's not like they don't have a, a mobile app and they don't have a, a website. They do. And they have pretty well-designed uh, mobile app and, and a website. On the mobile app, it tells you a lot more information about how far you're going getting towards your goals, you can reset the goals, you can do many other things, but it gives you enough, enough information to help you understand what's happening during that day. The PC experience, however, is a lot different. It has a lot more things. It's almost like a big infographic. It has, uh, you can set your monthly goals, you can set your annual goals, you can share your information with your friends so that you're, you might be, you know, have a nice kind of virtuous competition going on where you're kind of, you know, uh, egging your friends along. You can also, they can also give you badges as well, so that that's another kind of gamification of this whole uh, fitness uh, goals. So, I mean, there are many things that you can do on a PC that you really cannot do. You cannot squeeze this, even responsively, down to a uh, smartphone um, experience. And you cannot, and people won't carry that along with them, even on a wristband. So, the point being, each environment is different, and each environment, the user needs a different level of information and a different experience. They expect to be sitting in front of the PC when they're setting their goals and looking at how, they're, how well they're doing across six months, right? You wouldn't expect that. The users don't expect necessarily expect that on a smartphone, and they don't expect that on a, on a wrist device, right? So each level each different device and each different context requires a different level of user experience that needs to mesh with each other depending on what the user actually wants to do with these devices within their given context. Another great example is Goodwill. I mean, they don't have a very sophisticated website, and you know, but they do have a really nice website in that it gives you a lot of information about you know, what, what, what you, you might be looking for. Uh, if you want to volunteer, if you want to donate, if you want to, you know, find a store, if you want to find, you know, sign up for a newsletter. Uh, there's, there's many, many things. You, you know, what is Goodwill doing in your local community? You can find that, all that information on their website. It is, it's really good that way. However, if you're looking at uh, the Goodwill website in your car on a mobile device, what is the most likely scenario there? You're probably trying to find a local Goodwill store to donate something or to go and get something, right? That's, that is the most common uh, use case. And they actually understand this. And if you go to the Goodwill website on your mobile device, on your smartphone, it automatically redirects you to this page, which basically has one big box in the middle that is a zip code. You enter your zip code and it tells you where the nearest um, Goodwill store is. So, I mean, it doesn't require like Fitbit level of technology sophistication to actually understand your users and to give them what they need 
within a given context. Goodwill does that amazingly well, I think. So what about Drupal? How is Drupal handling this? How does Drupal allow you to handle something like this? I think within seven, and even more in eight, I think there are many ways that Drupal has the flexibility and the sophistication to be able to handle this. And at this point, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague who's been very patiently waiting <laughs> beside me to give you some t uh, a quick um, uh, overview of some of the things that Drupal can do to help this situation. Cool. So I want to take a few minutes to talk uh, about Drupal and show some of the great things that are coming down uh, the pipe in Drupal 8 to help us deliver fantastic experiences to our users in this new mobile landscape. I had a bit of a panic attack during the, uh, the keynote uh, as Dries walked through all this stuff. And so this will be a little bit of a refresher, but there's also, so there's a little bit of overlap, but also some new stuff as well um, uh, that I'll be talking about. So there'll be a test afterwards. So, Drupal has been a fantastic partner in helping us as individual contractors, as firms, as organizations uh, respond to and meet our users' needs. And I think that's for two key reasons. Uh, one is the code, uh, which is clean, secure. Our users trust it. It's well documented, and it's highly modular. Uh, but more importantly, I think it's the, uh, I think it's the community. Uh, the community is really smart passionate, transparent, welcoming, and big. And I think these characteristics actually keep the community and the work that it's doing pretty agile. Uh, it's able to respond to a variety of user needs, uh, even as they change over time. Uh, and I think that's evidenced by just the incredible variety and diversity of modules on Drupal.org, and also the health and vitality of the core Drupal product itself. Uh, a great example, I think, of this vitality is how Drupal has matured to support managing different types of content. Where 10 years ago, the average website may have had just two or three content types, many sites now have three to five times that. Organizations and individuals need to store all kinds of data on their websites, from blog posts, to recipes, to staff profiles, to fantasy football stats, to comic archives, to name just a few examples. And those data can relate to each other in really varied and complex ways. So where before everything, for example, may have been dumped into a WYSIWYG editor, now organizations want to be able to chop a piece of content up into fields to format it consistently across a site and pull metadata out of their content to improve its discoverability. And as anyone who's used Drupal 7 knows, uh, the community has definitely built a product that handles this incredibly well. You can use Drupal to store and manage pretty much any data model that you can imagine. So what's ex really exciting to us and to me is how Drupal is shaping up to be the same powerhouse in this new mobile world and landscape as it is in the content world. To be honest, Drupal already does a pretty decent job at mobile, uh, a really good job. There's a lot of responsive themes that are available for Drupal 7, both free ones on Drupal.org and commercial ones from a variety of Drupal theme stores uh, that help you deliver your existing site and content to a mobile audience. And if you have a single page web app or native mobile app in mind, you can harness Drupal's fantastic data management capabilities and use it as a data backend for your web app or mobile app. At Drupal.org modules like services, uh, REST web services, REST WS, uh, and Node.js, uh, which is another module on Drupal.org, can help you do that by serving up your Drupal content in JSON, XML, XML, and a variety of other formats. So if you want to do Drupal with mobile now, you definitely can. And I, I'm, I'm sure a lot of us already are. Uh, but what's exciting to me, again, are, are some of the cool changes in the mobile space for Drupal 8 that are going to make Drupal 8 even better for mobile. So Dries kicked it off. Uh, how many of you guys were at DrupalCon Chicago? So a fair, oh, actually not that many, okay. Um, so Dries kicked it off a couple of years ago at DrupalCon Chicago with, uh, in, in his keynote, I think, and he said, uh, if I were to start Drupal from scratch today, 
I'd build it for mobile experiences first and desktop experiences second. And that was kind of looking out at the sudden like explosion in growth of the mobile market. And with that, with that DrupalCon, I, I'm pretty sure it was that DrupalCon, uh, he launched a number of key Drupal 8 initiatives, several of which were for mobile. One of those is, was the mobile initiative, which has, uh, it, there's a team of people working on this, and they've been, the mobile initiative has been working to make Drupal responsive out of the box, and also improve front-end performance for mobile devices. There's the uh, HTML5 initiative, which is pretty cool, that adds support for HTML5 to Drupal. Uh, so if you've had a chance to look at Drupal 8's code, all the template files now use semantic HTML5 markup. And HTML5 is also supported at the API level, so module developers can build forms in their modules um, that use some of these new HTML5 elements, like uh, a phone field, or an email field, or a URL field. And this is pretty cool because browsers can take that and start doing things like data validation on the client side, uh, no JavaScript necessary. And the third initiative that's pretty sweet is the web services initiative, a core part of which adds a RESTful interface to Drupal's core, making it possible to use Drupal as a backend for web apps and native apps out of the box. So I wanted to split from the presentation for a second and walk through a couple of these things. Uh, let's see if I can do this. All right, there we go. And hopefully, I've got a monitor down here, but it's a, it's a little bit far away. Let's see if I can do this. All right, so, uh, so first up, for visitors that come to your site, um, we already saw this in the keynote, but Drupal 8 now ships out of the box. All of its themes are now responsive, which is pretty cool. Uh, so the sidebar is now off to the bottom there. And uh, the, another really slick feature in Drupal 8 is that Drupal 8 now supports responsive images as well using the new HTML5 picture element. And the picture element allows you to specify different image sizes or styles for each of your CSS breakpoints, mobile, tablet, and desktop on your website. So instead of, if you're on a, if you're on a smartphone, instead of it downloading the desktop image and then resizing it with CSS, um, the site actually can sense the screen width and download the appropriate sized image. So as you see here, if I slowly drag the window, um, the breakpoints take effect, and the corresponding image is downloaded. And if I open that up in a separate tab, whoops, wrong button. Uh, can I do this? Is it that one? OK, thanks. It's, it's kind of blurry up here. There we go. Yeah, so there's the actual sized, uh, there's the tiny image that it pulled down. Um, so that, that is really cool. That uh, saves a lot of bandwidth and reduces the page load time for your mobile devices. And for content editors, there's uh, some pretty cool new stuff. You already saw the navigation. So if I take this back down to smartphone size here and click on this guy, uh, you can see we get vertical navigation and this stuff opens up nicely, and I think, is that menus? Cool. And if I go into menu navigation, here you can see the other great things. Now all of Drupal's administrative forms are support mobile as well, or responsive, excuse me. Uh, so this was a, a huge pain point before if you wanted to administer your Drupal site on a mobile device. Uh, now I wanna show you a little bit of what of kind of one of my passions, and this is the web, web app space, uh, mobile web app space, and some of the, uh, uh, the cool stuff that's in store for Drupal 8 with that. So as, as Nam Ho said, mobile, app, mobile web apps, is, it's a rapidly growing space, and our users don't just want informational websites anymore, right? They want interactive 
online tools that help them get stuff done, and, and more importantly, help them get it done fast. Uh, so in other words, no page loads. And that means rendering the application in the browser, which means building the front end of your application with HTML5 and JavaScript uh, and a JavaScript framework like AngularJS or Backbone, or, or building a mobile native mobile app. That then leaves the server. Uh, the server is then able to focus on modeling, managing, and serving up your data to that app. Uh, and that's exactly what Drupal excels at really well. So I think web apps and some of these new JavaScript frameworks and CSS frameworks that are coming online uh, m make a great marriage. So a couple of examples. This is a, a site called County Health Rankings where it's a Drupal site, but we wanted to build a, oops, sorry, just that one click out here. We wanted to build a uh, web application inside one of the Drupal pages. Uh, and I might not be connected to the internet, so I might break it. But the, the important thing to take away is that uh, if I move around, oh, uh, yep. Yeah, it's, it's not loading data. Shoot. The, the important thing to take away is, one, it's, it's responsive. Uh, we were able to build its markup from the ground up using HTML5 and Angular, uh, Angular, a JavaScript framework. Um, and if, as, if I click through the application, it's probably going to break if I do it now, but, oh, there we go. It doesn't do a page load. It just loads new relevant data in place. Uh, so that's an example of a hybrid uh, web app and Drupal application that you can do. But with the new REST framework in Drupal, you can also do full-on web apps. And so I wanted to show a quick example of that. So this is built with Angular. And this is, if anyone's familiar with it, there's a great website out there called To Do MVC, which, lets, which provides um, which shows this to-do application built in a variety of HTML5 and JavaScript frameworks, so you can compare them and see how they, the different frameworks differ. Um, and so I took this, one of those, written in Angular, and then wired it up to Drupal. So let me just demonstrate this really quick. So it's real time. So I've got my little got my little to-do list real time. Uh, I can start checking things off here. And you'll see the page isn't refreshing when I do any of this stuff. And if I reload it, the data comes right back. So it's all getting saved to Drupal in the back end. But this is not sitting inside of Drupal. It's just using Drupal's REST API to, s to request and then save its data. Uh, so one of the neat things that I, I the, uh, one of the neat things about this new divisional labor afforded by REST and Drupal is um, with, with the front end in HTML5 and JavaScript and your data in Drupal is I think that it offers more design options to user experience professionals, professionals and I information architects and designers. Drupal. Anyone who's worked with Drupal a very long time knows Drupal can sometimes be fairly prescriptive in its page layouts and user experience. Um, but with a web app, you can build the front end HTML however you'd like and easily pull in a lot of these new frameworks like Twitter Bootstrap, Foundation, and JavaScript frameworks like Angular and Backbone uh, to help you out. So I think M Drupal's mobile future is, is really exciting. Uh, I'll definitely be attending as many Drupal data and mobile sessions this week as, it, as I can. Uh, and with that, I'd like to turn it back to Namho. And let's see. Oh. Not done yet. <laughs> so, so the question is, uh, the big question, and, and it's in the title of the presentation, is are web pages dead? Are web pages dead? I think. Um, I guess, I mean, I lied to you. They're not really dead. They're not dead yet, but uh, uh, we're still alive. <laughs> but uh, I, think, I think 
the importance of web pages in the traditional sense has vastly diminished. Um, people are, will be accessing more information um, through uh, mobile applications, and you know, I think Drupal is very well positioned to be able to um, take advantage of those uh, opportunities uh, and create a user experience that is highly contextual and highly device specific. And, I, and, and it's really exciting to see the developments that are happening you know, in the community around Drupal 7, but even more so in Drupal 8 in terms of the way that it's, it's going to accommodate many different ways of interacting with that information. And the, and the, and the truth is the user experience and, 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 and the users will be delighted to be able to see you know, the way that it's accommodating uh, their user needs. Uh, one of the th one of the you know big kind of um, uh, groups that really get underrepresented, I think, in, especially in tech uh, heavy conferences, uh, is the actual users themselves and what they want to do. And you know, as and uh, and it, this is fantastic that you know even DrupalCon as of this year has a user experience track which caters to the needs of um, of the users, the actual users who will be using the the the, the applications that you guys will be developing, but also the people who will be administering it on the back end. Those are uses too, but also you guys as well, in terms of the way that you need to code the information and the way that you want to present that information. So I think, you know, when you have a user focus, especially on th the all three levels, it's, it's, it becomes a much rich experience and a much more relevant experience and a much more uh, easy to use experience that can only benefit everybody else. Um, so I want to leave you with uh, three main points um, uh, in terms of thinking about the users. Thinking about the users. I think technology constantly changes, but you know, five years from now, who knows what will be in our pockets. Uh, but the thing is, our needs, our basic human needs, don't really change that much. We want to get from A to B. We want to have a good conversation with our friends. And we want to be near them. We want to you know, be able to take pictures and share them. So, you know, our social needs and our informational needs and our physical needs don't change that much. And once you start understanding those needs, I think that becomes a much more rich experience. So in order to do that, I think the first thing that we really need to concentrate, you know, even more is to know our users and their goals. And, you know, user experience professionals have done research and there's many research methodologies, but I think right now it's an exciting time because those research method methodologies and the way that we work are coming together with Agile as well. So there's a lot of lean UX going on as well to really get to what the users want in a very light and quick way and to incorporate that and integrate that within the development uh, life cycle. So, I mean, if you take a look at Goldilocks, I think the Goldilocks is a story of user testing, really, because, uh, you know, you have, you have Goldilocks coming to this house, and obviously, you know, the, the papa bear's, you know, porridge is too hot, and mama bear's is too cold, and, but, you know, baby bear's just right, right? And we want to be able to optimize our experience by understanding the users and delivering a just right experience. Secondly, I think, you know, the context that I've talked about, you know, the web, um, social, and mobile, you know, people shift be between these all the time. And as Drupal sites, you know, builders and people who work with Drupal, you'll, kn you'll know that, you know, people go from your site to uh, Facebook and back and do all kinds of things and access it from mobile. But once you understand what the user's needs are, then you can start optimizing and understanding those different contexts to be able to work with each other, not as a separate uh, experience, and to create a more kind of a, um, a, an integrated experience between those three different areas. Um, you know, recently I, I went to buy a, a knife and, and I realized that I know nothing about knives because look at all these different knives. I mean, you go to any, you know, like Bed Bath & Beyond and they have a wall full of knives. And, you, it, and it got me thinking, you know, it got me thinking that why are there so many knives, right? It's because there has been a user need, right? People realize that in order to chop bones, you need one, something that's hefty and big and you, it has a strong grip, whereas you wouldn't use that to cut a loaf of bread, right? You, no, you, 
wouldn't do that. You would have, I mean, it has the crust, right? And you have to have, you know, serrated knife edge so that you can just nicely cut through that bread, right? So knives, knives, different types of knives have been developed because there has been a user need. And somebody really understood those user needs to be able to create all these different types of knives. I think this is the job that we have. We need to understand what our users need and, and give them what they need in an optimized way and develop these different types of knives, right? Depending on, depending on the context, depending on where they want and how they want to access their information. And finally, I think, I mean, this is a very overstated word, but it's an ecosystem, really. And, you know, people don't live in vacuums and they need to go from one, you know, one, one different context and one different device uh, one from one to another. And in order to do that, you have to really kind of think of them as an ecosystem and really get them to work together. You know, and the only way to do that is actually understand the goal and understand the purpose of what the user wants to do. And that way, you can take those little pieces, little pieces of experience, and really drive them towards a single purpose. Um, you know, I, I wish I could you know, I can spend another two or three hours going through a lot more of the details and the research methods and, you know, uh, the user experience kind of methodology around how to get to each of these questions. But obviously, I just want, if there's one thing that I want you to go away with from this session is that, you know, throughout all the other sessions that you'll be attending at DrupalCon, think about how is this serving the user, right? How is this helping me serve the user? And how is this helping me help the users achieve their goals? I think, you know, when we see a device like this, you know, 2007 came around, Steve Jobs came out with the iPhone and it changed the way that we interact with devices. But I think when we fantasize and when we kind of idealize our devices, we forget that it is being held by a hand that belongs to somebody, right? It's not the technology. Technology, this phone, as much as it's beloved and, and loved and, and people can't live, with, live without it, in five years, 10 years, 20 years, God knows what we'll be using, but somebody will be using it, somebody who has a need to use this device. We have to take a step back and understand the hand, the person, the brain, who's actually using those, that, those devices and focus on those people first and understand them so that we can serve them better. Thank you. I think we have a few minutes to take some questions. I think there might be a mic in the middle. And I think we'll be able to take three questions. Hi. Um, in your Goodwill example, you showed how when a person reaches that site on their mobile phone, more than likely, they want to just put in their postal code to find a location. So when you go from the website to that application, you're not using responsive design, you're using user need design. So why is responsive design, how is responsive design gonna help me in that sort of instance? Because it's not being used, you're delivering a different segment of content completely. Right, uh, the, the question is how is responsive design uh, optimizing the experience for a person uh, from a mobile context coming to the Goodwill site? Yeah, when, when the content needs to change. Right, so I think that's a very big area that responsive design actually doesn't do a good job. And what's interesting is if you take a look at um, some of the, the mobile initiatives that Drupal 8 is coming out with, one is, uh, I think, REST, uh, Responsive Design Server-Side Components, which detect which context you're coming from, a mobile context, and only serve the components that might be, uh, that might be apt for that uh, for that context. So you're not serving the whole page uh, divided and, and reformatted into a mobile device, kind of scrunched into a mobile device. You're actually only going to be serving the components that are relevant to that context. So that's, that's something that's de in development, and, and I think that's the next step beyond responsive. You know, everybody, w w everybody was freaking out because there are so many devices and so many screens that they needed to accommodate. I think the first response was get things formatted and displaying o correctly and touch enabled on mobile devices. The next step is actually optimizing that experience to only serve up the components that you actually need. 
thing. Actually, as a related question, uh, I was noticing that, in fact, that site is the Goodwill site, and the mobile site is am.goodwill.whatever. So there really are two different sites. And yes. so just to follow on that question, um, do you think we'll be able to do that sort of thing? This maybe just elaborate on my answer you just gave. Do you think we'll be able to do the same uh, kind of context detection and delivery on a single back end or a single platform, or will we have to do a multi-site install for something like that? That, that's a great question, and uh, to be honest, I'm not, I'm not sure. I've read briefly about the, uh, the REST uh, development work that's happening, but I'm not sure where it is. Um, I think a good person to ask would be uh, Larry Garfield, uh, who, if you look in the schedule, uh, there's some talks on uh, REST and the Whiskey Initiative, um, so if you find him in the hallway, he'd be a great person, I think, to, that would be able to provide some answers around that. Is he the one, I'm, I, I'm not that great with names. He's giving the rest talk, or? I'd have to double check. His name is, uh, find, right. find me afterwards, and we can hook you that's up cool. with that session. Thanks. Right, but the thing is, I think that's where it's going. I think, you know, serving up a whole web page without optimized images, without optimized experience, into a, a small handheld device isn't, isn't optimal, and I think, you know, if, if the users are wanting that kind of a, a customized, optimized experience within a handheld device, I think responsive, I mean, in my opinion, uh, as a user experience professional, you know, responsive needs to go there and further. I work for a uh, large nonprofit in Washington and we're supposed to be serving donors across the country. We've been working to, and we have successfully put out a mobile website similar to Goodwill in that it's an m.domain.org kind of site. Um, one of the challenges that I've observed with our site in particular, we don't have uh, the same nonprofit model that Goodwill does. We aren't dependent on a network of geographic locations. And so there isn't an obvious um, context-aware application that would uh, sort of float to the top in a mobile environment. You touched on information hierarchy and choosing which chunks or components of an instance you want to really serve into uh, a mobile application. One of my questions has been, how do we go through a requirements discovery process where we say, what is the information that a user really needs when it's not super obvious, when we're not a travel agency, we don't have some of those really obvious uh, mobile device applications? The, the only real, real way to address that is to ask them or to observe them. You know? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's not easy and it takes some time, but basically uh, taking a handful of people and you know, seeing actually how they interact with them. For example, we work with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. We realize that you know, these people, it's a, it's a think tank in Washington and, and they, they push out you know, a lot of uh, documents, briefs, papers, and, and you know, policy briefs. And the people who are visiting their site want to be able to really get to those the latest ones as quickly as they want, as, as they can. And that's what we determine from taking a look at and, and understanding what their needs are. And they usually visit it in the morning as on their way to work. Mm -hmm. And we, we realize that's a need. And so we developed an application for that. And it's, it's, uh, it's the way that, that allowing the organization to really engage them in in a, in a far more intimate way because they understand what their needs are and when they want to approach the information. So I think, you know, asking them, <laughs> studying them, researching them, and taking a look at what they do and when they do it, I think is the easiest way to find out. That's helpful. Just to, to add on, um, we were at the Nonprofit Technology Conference recently and there was a great talk on mobile fundraising and I, I can't remember the name of the Nonprofit. I want to say it was a, like a, a health Mayo Clinic maybe. Um, they do online donations, and they had, it might not be Mayo, but it's it's a big nonprofit. They do mobile donations, and they had an M dot site. And what they found was the most commonly clicked link on it was the view full desktop site link at the bottom. <laughs> and so what they realized was they were doing a really bad job 
at targeting and figuring out what their mobile needs were, and so they switched to responsive. Because uh, even though it meant slightly longer page load times, it meant that you know they didn't, um, they weren't sure, you know their users could be accessing their phones in the bathroom and might actually be looking at information. You know they could be on the road and need something really quick, um, and so it, responsive for them became kind of a, a what would you call it like it. it captured everything. Right. And, and once you have a responsive site, then you can take a look at what people click on in the responsive site and determine maybe at that point what the most visited, commonly visited uh, feature on your site is in a, in a mobile environment. Great. Well, thanks for staying around. <laughs> I'll see you. <laughs>